Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. The sarong, her funny side and her sexual charm, plus her exciting singing talent, Dorothy L'Amour is sure an epitome of glamour. Her road movies are a somewhat summary of what she personified, the real transnational gorgeousness. A lady that stood out among her generation and affected society positively with energy and eagerness to serve humanity through entertainment for several decades. Why Dorothy L'Amour spent her nights with J. Edgar Hoover. As you all know how much I appreciate you, my viewers, I want to thank you for your generous comments and for the Patreons. This video would not have been possible without you, and thanks to those who watched the video right to the end. Subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Dorothy L'Amour, the Sarong Pinup Girl Over the years, one way Hollywood has been effective is always determining what constitutes beauty for a society based on transnational diversity. Dorothy L'Amour is perhaps the most significant Hollywood model, with slightly darker skin than the average Hollywood star. Noticeably not too dark, darker eyes and thicker eyebrows, but within the ambit of the white face standard that is usually projected. L'Amour, during her fruitful career in Hollywood, proved to the wider society that she had more to give the entertainment industry than just her arresting transnational beauty, because with her trademarked sarong image she was able to achieve what many Golden Age actresses could not. What is it about this New Orleans indigenous icon that captured Hollywood promoters' interest with her melodious voice? Some think she looked even more attractive in those striking poses several years down the line. Hollywood production and L'Amour have a lot in common because of what she portrays, attracting early fame in the adventure tale The Jungle Princess in 1936. She went ahead to rank high among the most popular pinups throughout the World War II period. Described as a sultry screen siren actress, Dorothy L'Amour was not bothered with the concept of accumulating awards because several things kept her busy within the entertainment circle. Critics say she was busier trying to move away from her miniskirt image. This dark-haired beauty was said to have tantalised Golden Age cinema audiences with her miniskirt image on the big screen, with an historic collaboration between her, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby in seven road comedies. She left an unforgettable memory for her fans. Contrary to what she made her audience feel in the movies, those String of Ireland theme films for which she put on that seductive outlook, that wowed thousands of viewers. L'Amour did not see the South Seas until she was almost 70, a characterisation that ironically made her famous, the reason it is called movie. L'Amour, whose career stretches for more than half a century, had a productive comic career history. It was said that before the production My Favourite Brunette in 1947, a paramount mystery comedy, Dorothy L'Amour, with the help of the studio's publicist, staged an outstanding stunt. She was said to have openly burned a sarong, the scanty South Seas piece of clothing with which she had been inseparably linked since that initial starring role in The Jungle Princess. The aim of the stunt was probably to mark the end of her image as the sarong girl, as she was thereafter transitioned from jungle princess to favourite brunette. It was a very busy period for this paramount actress, with L'Amour appearing in about 34 feature films, and strongly establishing her prowess as Paramount's top female box office appeal, even as she grew her fan base to an astronomical high. Even though L'Amour wore a sarong in just a few of the 34 movies within the 10-year period with the studio, her widely respected audience continued to talk about her sarong. As such, it became an indelible connection between her and that garment. Is it just about the plodding eyes of these ambitious audiences, or is there something special about L'Amour's beauty and the sarong? Not even the concerted effort by the studio with stunts and other tactics could take the sultry image away from her fans. This glamorous brunette siren was said to have uniquely lived more quietly than any other Hollywood movie icon in the same apartment amidst her fame, though with a touch-up to suit her taste for a very long time. So expectedly friends and relatives come in occasionally, but she always would not be available to entertain them because she kept herself busy. 
Dorothy Lamore, officially known as Mary Letter Dorothy Slatton, was born on 10th of December 1914 in New Orleans. Her parents, Carmen Louise and John Watson Slatton, were waiters by profession. Lamore's descent is somewhat complicated, with biographers suggesting that she may have had a link with Spanish and some English, French and perhaps some far Irish descent. After her parents divorced, her mother was remarried to Clarence Lambour, whose name Dorothy is now using, though she had to alter the alphabet by removing the central letter B, while the sound remained similar, even though the second marriage also terminated when Dorothy was in her teens. At the age of 14, an ambitious Lamour, threatened by economic hardship, held a different idea about what she wanted her life to look like. The immediate result was to halt her education. Perhaps out of the need to make ends meet, she began a job as a secretary, working and supporting herself and her mother. Being so beautiful with a remarkable figure, Lamour may have thought it was wise to try her luck in modelling, as she was said to have entered a beauty pageant and got lucky with the outcome as she was crowned as Miss New Orleans in 1931. With that taste of fame, Lamour went on to contest in other pageants. Gradually, she got herself connected to theatre production, befriending the likes of Dorothy Dell, the Ziegfeld Follies star. With her pageant prize money, she was able to offset her bills and develop her singing talent in theatres. Soon she was relocated with her mother to Chicago, where she took a job at Marshall Field's department store. Then she was just 16, working as an elevator hand. Douglas Singletary, her workplace superior, would refer to her as Dolly Face. Within the period, Lamour was also scouting all nooks and crannies for an opportunity, attending several auditions in the city until she was spotted by orchestra leader Herbie Kay, who admired her outings at a Chicago talent program. After her audition with Kay, Lamour was signed in as a singer for his band in 1935 and touring with Kay in his production. Lamour worked her way into vaudeville and radio production. But her relationship with Kay was more than just professional, as the young beauty was smitten with Kay hook, line and sinker. So while Kay was helping her groom her talent, he was also helping himself emotionally. And in 1935 the couple were married, a year before she moved over to Hollywood. At the time, Lamour already had 15-minute weekly musicals on NBC Radio before entering Hollywood for more opportunity and was signed by Paramount Pictures. And when Lamour, like a house on fire, wore a sarong, she suddenly became a prodigy and was dubbed the Sarong Girl. That was how the New Orleans Queen turned into a sarong queen. Reacting to this, Lamour once said it's better than being known as the Sweater Girl, jokingly, I had my tactic. Every gal should have one to become a big attraction, she had said. Kay and Lamour's marriage soon hit a brick wall as they went their separate ways in 1939. Lamour was united in love the second time, but this time with an Air Force captain, William Bill Howard. The duo wedded and remained faithful to each other until Bill's demise. As World War II was raging, Lamour became a unique kind of hero, when she was able to sell $300 million value of bonds meant to support the war and was subsequently nicknamed the Bond Bombshell. Soon Life magazine took the story from a different angle, hailing Lamour and referring to her as the number one army pin-up girl. That stint saw her going home with $9 million in cash in the first six days, plus $31 million at the end of the first tour, as she once proudly remembered. A section of the media had reported that Lamour was highly successful as a saleswoman and that the state provided a private railroad car for her Bond tours. She also took time out to unwind, spending hours dancing and connecting with dignitaries, as she was always sighted at the Hollywood Canteen, sometimes in the nightclub for servicemen established by famous Betty Davis and John Garfield. Richard Howard, her son, who once talked about her, described Lamour as a woman that did not forget her humble beginnings as a child. Lamour's proudest achievement, he thinks, is having a family. As one who did not forget her roots, Lamour ensured that her children didn't pass through the same hurdle. Richard recalled her funny habit of assembling S&H green stamps to paste in her stamp books, and when the book is filled, she'd take them to the five-and-dime redemption venue to get her entitlement, and sooner 
she would be discussing it with friends in the neighbourhood. Despite her fame, it seems Lamour never gets over her past. It was so bad that Lamour's mother was said to have once used curtains from their windows to construct her costume for a high school dance, long before she found success. For the same reason, she could not proceed with her school as a teenager. Rather, she became active career-wise, looking for a livelihood at such a tender age, sometimes selling real estate junkets just to keep the family going. Richard, said Lamour, was a symbol of a true rags-to-riches success story, as the experiences may have inspired her to move away from poverty by all means. She had to pass through very much more before fortune smiled on her, with the beauty queen coronation, which was like a turning point in his mother's life, he stated. Lamour was the kind of mother who would ask her kids to make their beds, clean the house and do the chores. My mother, led by example, never acted like those pampered women. She was her own secretary and publicity agent, and simultaneously managed her career, marriage and children with grace, class and dignity, Richard said with great respect for Lamour. Perhaps he also heard Lamour talk about her true love for the country and how she wanted to do all she could to help the state. No wonder she had regularly stated that selling those bonds and marrying his father were the happiest times of her life. At some point her regularity in the film industry was reduced, as she took time off to care for her family, though she never stopped showing up when the need arises. She made a final movie appearance in 1987's Creep Show 2, when she was asked why her career went sedentary after she turned a mother, Lamour was quick to deny the insinuation by saying, Inactive? Is that how you define giving birth to two great sons? What you see as inactivity is what I call maternity. Lamour once said that she was the happiest and highest paid straight woman in the business, referring to her movies. The legendary sarong, designed by Oscar winner Edith Head, ended up in the Smithsonian Institution's costume collection. Like many, Lamour once expressed surprise at the popularity of the said apparel and how it shaped her career. She said that it kind of hindered her career too. They expect you to always be the young girl leaning against the palm tree, adding, I made sixty films and wore the sarong in perhaps six pictures, but it still becomes a kind of trademark, she had said. Lamour is one of the many actresses that are classic creations of Hollywood star structure and studio promotional logjam. While under contract to Paramount Pictures, they promised in commercials to display everything about glamorous Lamour in line with censorship standard plus or minus the sarong, but fans fortunately decided what met their fancy and the miniskirt did. Though she was prevalent at the box office, Lamour was adjudged a limited entertainer, perhaps the reason she never won an award. A writer who knew about this had hinted it when he said this is the one thing of which nobody ever accused Dorothy Lamour in the thirties. The first sarong film role in The Jungle Princess, a movie that is thematically a tale about a pilot, portrayed by Ray Milland, who crashes his airplane in a forest and discovers Ula, a local girl in a sarong, was awesome. Sometime in 1940s, Lamour joined Hope and Crosby to produce four road movies. It was such a success that in 1953, Paramount Studio brought them together again in another positive Road to Bali. As they say, you don't change a winning team. Perhaps the studio was thinking in that line when they, for the third time, put the team together for the final movie in 1961, The Road to Hong Kong. However, Lamour would later describe that final version as a terrible end to a good series. Possibly because the female lead was replaced as she dropped her role for a younger Joan Collins. Was Lamour hurt? She was said to have taken a guest spot in that final production. J. Edgar Hoover is someone that also played a role in Lamour's life. At the early part of her career journey, Lamour met and began a romantic affair with Hoover, who was then the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The information available, as revealed by Hoover's biographer, Richard Hack, detailed the said romance between the pair. Their relationship may have been discreet, as such did not get media attention at the time, even though the two carried on for a while with their love life. She was said to have spent nights with Hoover, her lover, severally at a Washington, D.C. lodge. Responding to questions about this, Lamour admitted having fruitful romantic affairs with him. 
I cannot deny it, she had said. However, in her autobiography, My Side of the Road, in 1980, Lamour, regardless, did not talk about Hoover in detail, preferring to address him as an old-time pal, a lifelong friend, she had written. After marrying her Air Force captain husband, who was also an advertising manager, on the 7th of April 1943 in Beverly Hills, the duo produced John Ridgely and Richard Howard. Sometime in 1957, Lamore and her family relocated to Baltimore, Maryland, and the suburb of Sudbrook Park. Similarly, in 1962, they also moved over with the children to Hampton, a related Baltimore suburb in Delaney Valley where their first child began early education at Towson High School. The union between Dorothy Lamore and William Howard, as you already know, endured until Howard's demise in 1978. When the news of Lamore's death came on the 22nd of September 1996, almost everyone felt that the industry had lost an icon, with mourners describing her as a lady of quality, beauty and class. Dorothy Lamore couldn't say no to the king of the FBI. How about the king of rock and roll? Why Deborah Paget turned down Elvis Presley's marriage proposal? Watch this video.